but we can go through the waiting bill, which we are pretty much decided on. I think <coughs> I think I got it straight for the caucus today that we were going to pretty much follow the recommendations of the, um, the task force with which is basically all waiting we're keeping the waiting numbers i think i can explain to barry and you 32 the differences um we are going to do with with ed's recommendation for the ell students a weight plus an individual payment per student and what else did i miss in there um, well, I can take you through the draft, even though Jim's not here. There are changes from the last time, some of the ones that we discussed, and then a few other things that have come up. That have come up. Um, I met with the Secretary of Education last week, and they made a few suggestions. They're pretty minor, but I'm happy to walk you through this. Well, this is going down. All right. Um, GR draft three, draft There's four. Copies here. There's copy. It's 4.3. Yeah, I think. that is draft four. Uh, uh, anybody? Okay. Now, did he happen to highlight the changes? Um, I think that they're highlighted. From, yes. The first change is not until page six. So. Away. Where am I? Let's stop it again. It's not quite 40 pages yet, no. but it's almost there. Let's get in there. All right, first change is on six. So, uh, do you want me to walk you through the whole bill again or just the changes? Let's just go through the changes. Okay, so starting on page six, um, this is, if you recall, we talked about the changes for um, moving from right now, we do eligibility for nutrition benefits through the SNAP program. We're going to have a one year where we're doing a free and reduced lunch, and then we're going to move to the universal income form. So section four makes the change moving from the SNAP benefits to the um, free and reduced lunch for the first year. And then section 4A moves from the free and reduced lunch to the income, to the universal income declaration form. So that's why it's sort of the same section drafted twice. And yeah, these all seem to be yeah, so More drafting or stylistic. Right. So this was just to clarify, because you'll recall it wasn't quite clear when we would be making that shift. Um, okay. And this would also include all students who are not English language. So current law, the reason why that's drafted that way, section four, current law, students who are ELL students are actually included as students who live in poverty. There's the current law makes that assumption and includes okay. them. So this would keep that the way it is for the first year before the new weights go into effect. So essentially, for the, uh, and then it would move to, if you look at 4A, that language is struck um, and it goes to the universal income form because that's when the new pop, the so new poverty weight and the child of a Saudi prince, they're not getting free and reduced lunch the second year. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And it's well, just, do we have any of those? But just in case. There's a few questions that I've had, we're already working a bit about the form is what happens when people don't fill it out? One, or two, what happens when people fill it out with inaccurate information? 
And is there any thought about what the rate of non-compliance will be, which I suspect will be quite high at this initial rate? So I think that's true for the current methods as well. So yeah. I don't think that there's yeah. going to be too much of a change in terms of, I can't decide whether foggy glasses are better or not. Um, I don't think there's going to be too much of a change in terms of not non-compliance or inaccurate information from what we currently have. Um, but the the agency of education is tasked in the bill of creating the new form and has a little working group um, that would do so so that working group could could work to address that and how school districts the, the form is supposed to be fully accessible it would be everybody would be required to do it i mean i can tell you just my own personal example i never fill out the free and reduced lunch form because i know my family wouldn't qualify mm -hmm. But if this, if my school district told me you should fill this out, I would fill it out. And I think now I'm not the average, you know, but but I think that there would be school districts would be really working to get it filled out because it would need additional tax right. capacity. I, I'm, I'm thinking in them. particular though of taxpayers like you whose families wouldn't qualify. How much of a privacy objection there's going to be to collect information that they would argue that you don't need? Well, I think that this form is is allowed by the federal government and it is based on the brackets it's not based on specific income yeah. so i wouldn't have to say exactly how much my family makes mm -hmm. but just sort of like check in the bracket and it would be covered by all of the same kind of confidentiality um requirements i'm, that I'm just anticipating get. that you know there, there are going to be privacy objections that if the purpose of this is to you know deal with free and reduce lunch that you know and clearly, I don't want free of them. My kids don't want free of them. Why are you making me fill this form out? It's going to be an argument that you'll hear. And second, there will be concerns about confidentiality. Yeah, and I think that um, later on in the bill, we also make recommendations that we have that new yeah. Ed fund thing yeah, yeah. to come back with recommendations. So yeah. I think if there are issues, there are a couple of mechanisms in the bill that would allow them to be addressed or at least highlighted. I'm just anticipating objections. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're, you're right. I'm not sure that it's going to be any worse than it is now. It's just going to be yeah. different. I mean, this is the thing, the teacher is going to safety pin to the kid's jacket yeah. to make sure <laughs> that you had that. <laughs> Why is that pinned to your jacket? Because my teacher doesn't think I'll give it to you. Yeah. The truant ah. officer will come to get the form if you don't bring it in. That's right. The truant officer, yes. So Actually, they have a, quite an active program in Winooski where if you don't come to school, yeah. they do come preach. We'll bring so, it. oh, sorry, sorry. Um, section five is the, the section about the universal income declaration form. That would start in the 23-24 school year. And it would be set at 185% of poverty, which is currently what we use for both free and reduced lunch and SNAP. So it's not a change in the poverty level. It's just a change in how we collect the information. And then there's created um, on or before October 1st of this year, the Agency of Education has that working group. And it would be a statewide um, um, to determine whether to determine whether people is from an economically deprived background. Um, so that those are the the first changes, and those were the ones that we talked about um, last uh, part of what we talked about last committee member. Okay, time. so this is really it, it's more of a technical. It's not substantive. It's, it's not. It's just clarifying it because I think when we read it last time you all had some questions about it and it was good because I had read it so many times I understood it but you didn't and that showed me that we needed to clarify it so hopefully this clarifies it um page 10 is the next change um and this is also a clarifying change um to align that the small school enrollment with the population density enrollment just clarifying that we have that the the agency would have to um, a, to provide both because there's a threshold. Not all small schools get the small school bait. It's only small schools in low population density areas. Okay. So that would be aligning that. And then on page 11, it's the same kind of uh, uh, aligning um, with those two measures. And then the next change is... 
um, page 17, there's just an insertion of a word. And this is in the ELL section of the things that the agency is required to do. Um, the secretary asked if we could insert professional development resources. So it was clear, it, it was clear that the agency wouldn't be required to actually do the professional development. School districts could do the professional development. Just write a check. But the agency could provide resources, guidance, you know, curriculum, et cetera. But the local school districts or some other organization could do the actual professional development for teachers and support personnel. So that was minor but important to AOE. Um, yeah, so we have struck uh, the well, striking that, that, anyway, that's that was old. before that was the small schools grants, yeah. the current small schools grants getting rid of them, um, which yeah. pretty much everybody loves. Um, okay, I'm okay, so page 26. This came up. Um, this the task force mentioned talked about this briefly. And it came up with a um, superintendent's meeting that I was at. We currently require school districts to put on their budget ballots language about the increase or decrease on a per equalized pupil basis for their budget. And um, voters see it. If you all just voted on your school budget, you probably saw it on your ballot. No, nobody looks at it. I didn't look at it. <laughs> well, but it's one of the methods we have tried putting things on the ballot to make people think about whether or not they're going to vote for it. Right. So the problem is, is during the transition, because we're changing the pupil weights, equalized pupils are going to change pretty drastically in some districts, and they're going to change <laughs> all in all districts. So through no change at all of the school budget, the per pupil spending on an equalized pupil basis will change in a school district. And so it will be super confusing to voters because things are going to be going up and down. I and had 5,000 this year, and I've got 6,000 students, and I don't know where anybody moved into town. Right. So it's going to be super confusing. So we have talked about this briefly. So this just um, suspends that during the transition, just like we suspend other things that are going to kind of be out of whack during the transition. And um, later on in the bill, this there's uh, a requirement that this Education Fund Advisory Committee make a recommendation for when to bring that back in and what it would say, or if to bring that back in, or if there's some other way to do it. So when I get to that, I'll explain that too. So then the next um, change is on page 28. It's one of those small word changes that was, makes a big difference. This is the audit requirements. And there was a long list of things to include in the audit. So measurements, um, the quality standards, test scores, the TOEFL scores, the uh, youth risk behavior surveys, graduation rates, et cetera. The secretary asked that we that he, he thought that that was a really, really long list and might be very, very difficult to get all of those things into an audit. We already have the requirement that AOE, the Education Fund Advisory Committee, and the auditor would, would determine what um, the, the sort of standards are for the audit and the scope of the audit. So we changed this from a shall include to a may include. So that not all of those measures would have to be in there. Um, so that's that. I, you know, I would, I think, ideally like them all in there, but he was very concerned that that would be difficult. So that was their request. And then on page 29, this is the language about the auditor hosting a web page. This is what Senator <coughs> Brock um, requested to make sure there's trans transparency. So it would have this act, whatever it is that passes, the statement of work that is agreed upon, any reports to the General Assembly about its work, and then all of the metrics that are used, which what's the list that they end up deciding to use. That was that. On page 31, this is changes to the powers and duties of the education um, fund advisory committee. Okay, and this we did go over last time. Yeah, so 
what is here there are a couple things that um so changes we added um a section actually this is not one that we went over there are some things we went over and some things we didn't so the powers and duties updating the weighting factors changes or addition to elimination of the categorical aid changes to income levels for the property tax credit under um that so that was the thing that you and um Senator McDonald, we're talking about like the, the income threshold for yeah. property tax credit. Right. She keeps up the way it is. Right. I got to go fill my gas tank. So it, we took out the stuff that was this, as you said, the sort of purely mathematical. Yeah. Um, the means to adjust the revenue sources for education fund, including whether to transition to an income, education income tax. So that was a okay, uh, way to put that in there. And there's a little bit more of that later. And the means for improving equity, transparency, and efficiency, whether and when to it, it reinstate the excess spending threshold, and whether and when to um, reinstate that language that we just talked about on a school okay. budget. So that, and then further down in paragraph three, in the initial report, since we've talked about the income tax thing and come to no conclusions and we're running out of time, um, Senator Pearson and I talked about putting it in here so that this tax fund could make recommendations on some of the things that we were sort of getting stuck on. How do you deal with the renter's credit? How do you administer such a new thing and ways to transition? And this would be done in conjunction with this committee, the JFO and the Department of Taxes. And so just making recommendations on, on sort of how could it maybe work? And then, and, but no recommendations on definitely doing it, but just how it might work. Well, that just saves me my separate discussion. There, there you go, Madam Chair. <laughs> Trying to help out to move things along. Um, down below, pay, on the bottom of page 39, it just moved. Originally, I had eight minute meetings per year for this new committee, and that seems like excessive, so I changed it to four. It also makes it cheaper. Um, so that makes the change on uh, top of page 33, changes the appropriation from 5,000 to 2,500. And um, the joint fiscal and AOE have to come into, enter into an MOU. And this just change, uh, adds language about updating the weights and recalibration and recalculation the same language that is above for that committee. On page 34, the Agency of Education staffing request or staffing um, six positions, the secretary wanted them a little bit rearranged. Um, so there would be one position for ELL because he said there's already a position. And so he thought two for ELL would be sufficient then two that would work on the universal income declaration form and provide guidance to school districts on its use. And then the three positions for finance and data. So it's still six positions. He did adamantly support the six positions. He thought that they were necessary to be able to do all the work that's required. And then I think the final change is just in the effective dates, adding the effective dates for various things that were just added and renumbering. Okay. So those are the changes since the last time we saw it. Question, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, when you get page 31, there are references to the new educational property tax system. And is that referring to the weighting system that we're talking about here? Or which which one? page on page 30. Um, yeah. Let's see. Make recommendations on the implementation of an education income tax system to replace the homestead education property tax system. So this would be recommending when, how or whether to. It would sort of first be whether, right? Make recommendations on implementation 
I sort of was like wonder. possible implementation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so pos I mean, that was the intent was it with the possible implementation okay. so it's and listing some of the things that were sort of sticking points, like well, how do we deal with renters? How do we implement it? That kind of thing. So it's not referring to something that was previously in the bill, which is a new system. Right. Yeah. Than yeah. The waiting, which is being folded into the current. Exactly. So this would be, you know, we have that other bill that we have, don't have time to get to. This would sort of plant the seeds for trying to answer some of the questions to decide whether or not we want no to. Wait, where's the new system in here? Correct. Right. Yeah, and, and if there's some tweaking you want to do to it, that's totally okay. fine. That the intent was mostly just to get some more information and see if it's even feasible. And if not, then we can ignore the information. <laughs> That works. Yeah, and that maybe that will save committee. Us. Does this work? We we got the joint stuff that also got handed out. Yeah, so um, Julia did a then Julia one. is here, or at least I say your name. There's Julia. Okay, so Julia, can you just run it up <coughs> yes. since this is our area of responsibility? Okay. Sure. Julia Richter, Joint Fiscal Office. Um, so on the committee page, there should be the fiscal note posted under my name. And this is a fiscal note um, that is corresponding to the draft of the bill that Senator Hardy just walked the committee through. Um, do you want me to pull it up on my screen or do you want me to just walk through the document? I think um, just walk. I think we've all got a paper copy or maybe Senator Pearson, if it's posted, can you've got yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, I've got it on my computer, so no need okay. to do it for me. So just talk to us. This is the brave new world. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well. Um, Someday you'll actually get to sit in here. I look forward to it. Um, I'm over in the Pink Lady every day, so feel free if you'd like to come over and meet me in person. But um I'll start out with the fiscal note. So um, overall in fiscal year 23, JFO estimates this bill would result in a $602,500 fiscal impact to the general fund um, and would have an unclear fiscal impact to the education fund in future years. So starting out with the general fund uh, fiscal impact, this stems from the two appropriations that are spelled out in the bill. So the 2,500, which is for the per diem and reimbursement of expenses for the members of the education fund advisory committee, and then the 600,000 for the full-time positions um, for AOE. So, I guess before I move into the potential fiscal impacts to the education fund, I will pause there and see if there's any questions about those numbers. I'm not seeing any. I think those are pretty straightforward. Yep. Okay, then, <laughs> then moving on, um, I guess there's sort of two, two um, sort of buckets to talk about. So the first would be regarding the ELL categorical grants. So if we assume that the ELL categorical grants were to result in full increased spending, um, in FY24, we estimate this, this would result in approximately $1.75 million impact to the education fund. Um, and this stems from the categorical aid of 25,000 provided to districts with one to five ELL students and 50,000 to districts with six to 25 ELL students. So as I know the committee is well aware, absent any other changes in policy, an increase in spending um, would result in the base homestead yield and or the base non-homestead tax rate um, would need to be adjusted to account for any increase in in spending. Um, but that is that is an assumption. So that's 
Um, I do want to flag that. Before moving on to the other potential fiscal issues, are there any questions about that portion? I am not seeing any. Not a roll. Okay, then moving on, I'm, I'm on page two now um, in this third section, the other potential fiscal issues. And so with the adjustment of the pupil weights, tax capacity will be shifted for most school districts and towns. So that means that assuming education spending remains constant, some towns tax rates would increase while other towns tax rates would decrease. And so, in other words, assuming this education spending remains constant, towns that have that would have fewer equalized pupils with the new weights than they had with the prior weights would have higher tax rates, while towns that would have more equalized pupils with the new weights than they had with the prior rates would have weights, excuse me, would have lower tax rates. So this is likely to have an effect on the education fund, including the property and income yields, um, the base non-homestead tax rate. But this effect is, is unclear as um, education spending is determined at the local level, which leads me into the second related major bullet point here, that total education spending is determined by local votes and may increase. Um, districts with increased tax capacity, which is what I just spoke about, may increase education spending, while districts with decreased equalized pupils and thus decreased tax capacity may not choose to decrease spending significantly. But I do, of course, want to reiterate that um, while the changes in weights and changes in ELL funding may change local decisions and local um, funding choices, the actual change in, in total education spending is determined at the local level, which is why it's unclear what effect this would have on the education fund. So I guess from my end, in terms of going through the fiscal note, um, that's what I've prepared, but I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Committee. I am not seeing that. Okay, thank you. A lot of unknowns in this one. But I'm clear. I'm clear. <laughs> we knew that going in. I think we should have a pool in which we uh, select the percentage of increase in overall education spending we expect to result from passage of this bill. <laughs> I if over the, the over, yeah. over the rate of inflation. I, I think, yeah, I, I, we've had so much pressure on schools to keep their spending down that if they can lose taxing capacity without going up, I'm going to be surprised. Um, some schools will do well, but some of the others, it's, it's going to be, this is going to be a hard one. Okay. Any further questions or discussion? <laughs> Every year when we've gone home for town meeting, we've known what the yield was going to be or the tax rate was going to be. Do we know that yet? Not unless it's in one of the bills, the House had over. I We never, it's usually in miscellaneous tax. So it is never set in stone until the last, that, and that's usually one of the last. The house, if it's way off from the December, and I think this year. Yeah, we phrased the question, Go ahead. Yeah, I think this year the house did put a bill out to indicate that the, no, that was last year, the, the December 1st letter because it was based on all of our $150 million deficit in the Ed Fund. They sent one out early on to message. And I think we do that letter, and that's what towns are basing it on. 
usually put out a number that we believe um, that would a number that would it would not be higher than sort to the end of the session. Sometimes it came out a little bit lower, uh, but we've always been able to take a chart to if you vote this, if you vote that. This is what you can depend on, and maybe better than that. But there were no charts this year. No. Wow. Well, okay. Julia, can you help us? Sure. So I think that um, Senator McDonald, you're referencing charts that were put out in previous years. My understanding is that those were not um, put out this year because there is the large surplus on the bottom line of the education fund. So it's unclear um, what will happen with the yields and with the tax rates because there are there is this this surplus. I will say that Ways and Means has been taking testimony. Um, they started pre-town meeting. They they took more testimony today about how school budgets have come in um, in accordance with what was originally anticip anticipated. They're they're a bit higher than was um, forecasted in the December one letter, but um, we're still working to to make sense of those numbers um and and ways and means is 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 discussing it does that answer your question um it does and it leads me to the next question which was is we adjourned the town meeting i mean you asked me to put in a request to jfo to bring us back an estimate on how many vermonters uh, paid their school taxes Based on their income as a percentage of the of the population, and, um, which has occasionally been eighty percent and then drifted downward, back up and downwards, to find out what it was today. Have we? I think this is two weeks later. Do we have a? Do we have a number? On, yeah, on, I on. I actually did share um, that number with. Um, Sorry. Okay. Senator Cummings, and I, I did send it to you. I don't, I don't know if it was missing your inbox. Um, oh, I'm sure it's lost somewhere in my email. So. No, it's okay. I'm happy to forward it to you again. I did respond um, I that day. I think you just tell now we're fine. Okay, so in fiscal twenty, um, fiscal year 2023, we estimate that approximately 67% of Vermont households will receive a property tax credit. 67% in fiscal? Fiscal year 23, so the, the year that we're talking about moving into. And what is it this year? This year, I don't have that number in front of me. I can I can send it that to you later. Okay. But like, it is definitely slipping down. Yeah, yeah it's going down. So, yeah. so it, we think that it's higher than 67%, but we'll find out later? Yeah, because what it was before was more around 70%. So I think it's kind of declining. That's another adjustment. That I know it's it's around 70%, the exact percentage. Um, I just, I don't have, but I will I, I will forward that to the committee. 72 sticks in my mind for some reason. It's in that ballpark, but it is significantly lower than the 80 we originally aimed for. Yeah, so I mean, that's what one of the things we recommend. We asked them to recommend the level, the income level. What year? So, so that the education fund advisory committee thing, that was one of the things that's added on to their duties is to recommend changes to the income level. But they're not going to meet and make a recommendation in the next three or four weeks. Are they? No, 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 no. So we could change it now. But, um, well, if there's going to be a recommendation to, to deal with that, it's got to be done. So. Do you have a recommendation? Eighty percent. Okay, but you just don't recommend that you're going to do numbers. You got to set the income level and set levels. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I would suggest that, that might be something we put on the miscellaneous tax bill because this bill is coming out of here. While you're um, getting that other number for this year, could you share with us what? Um, how we would have to appropriate money to restore 80% of Vermont's working families to pay uh, their school taxes based on their house makers based on income. I 
I think what he's asking is if joint fiscal, and I think this will be cooperative, can give us an income level. Right now it's at 90 and it, or is it up to 100 and it ramps down. It, there, oh. There's two different, it's it's at 90,000 yes. and then as it moves up, then the level of homestead value decreases. Which decreases, yep. yes. The slope. Yep. What would the number, the 90,000 have to be for 80% of Vermont families who live in homes to pay their school taxes based on their incomes? Okay, sure, we can look into that and I'll get back okay. to you. Okay. Committee. Not, we've got a heavy agenda tomorrow. I've got, did everybody get the timeline? No one's with you. Okay. He's going to be in. I've got waiting and feminine hygiene products on for vote on Thursday. If I could get them out sooner, I'd like to because they're going to approach. Great. And I'd, I'd can like we still to. Have questions on the waiting? Can we, can we I don't think today? so. And if my next thing was, and what are we going to do about the income base? But you put that in there. And if that works for you and Senator Pearson, because um, I've been trying to get some stuff, but joint fiscal is in no position right now to free up the right people to, to do it. So um, if you can do the waiting with this in it, yeah, we still got 212 and there's always miscellaneous tax, but I think this outside committee and we may actually have to do some money for a consultant, depending on what they find out. Um, what well, my attitude is: this gives the house something to look at if they if they want to, and yeah. I would hope it doesn't end our work on it. But it's no. a little marker. It it's, it won't. It's just looking for breathing space. Yeah, that was the intent, trying to give you some breathing space. <laughs> I appreciate that, all of us. I would prefer not to go to 10 o'clock. Um, I don't know what ACE 88 is, but that that's that regulating a lot of small cannabis cultivation farming. I would assume we will vote that out tomorrow. That was saying, yeah, we know it can't be agriculture, but if you to a thousand by thousand lot or foot growth, it doesn't detract from your current use because it's not agriculture by federal standards and it carried over the agricultural tax exemption for if you're buying twine to tie up your cannabis plants for buying a tractor. Uh, what time are we starting tomorrow? Are we actually starting at 1 30? Yeah. Okay. I tried moving it back on Friday, so no one shows up till 1 30 anyway, so I gave up. <laughs> um, energy savings accounts, that's are we going to extend those that pilot program that just didn't get off the ground? And then yes, they slow the renewable power. Then we are going to go up or down on Rygate. Really? All right. And I'm not Rachel Smolter called and asked to testify on biochar. Um, and the timeline is there. I thought we were actually might get someone from the board or the PUC. And then, ah, yes, 437. The House would like out 
Um, we're going to go back over it. That's that little something for everybody, Bill. I did get an email from Peter Tucker from the realtors who said they'd like to testify, and I said fine. Um, but I don't, no one else has asked. And then the utility construction work site. Um, I don't know if we're ready to vote that or not, but FX Flint has sent me, I assume maybe some of you, emails. Apparently, EC Fiber is not involved in the lawsuit. They've been dropped. In the... So he wants to come in and explain to us what actually happened is the who is in, in the insurance process because we're trying to make sure and I'm not sure that there's a problem. We're trying to solve a problem that may not exist unless we want to find a way that no plaintiff has to go to court and when you're dealing with insurance companies, I don't know that, but we will find out what the deep, the actual details of the present. He has told us years ago, they don't put fiber on posts. That's not what we see fiber does. Yes, I know that. We're going to hear what, who had insurance, when they had insurance, before we start telling people they have to have insurance. It sounds like they may already have to have insurance. And we may be trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. I think it sounds like it's not that the Hoyts are not going to have their uh, losses covered. It's just that it takes a while, which for them, it is very difficult. Um, Which appropriations committee told us that no one had made a request to how to tie it that waits over on the, yeah. on the supplemental bill. Well, I told will be you to set up a GoFundMe page. I they did have a GoFundMe page, and it's, it, it's paid a substantial portion. Good. Um, but it hasn't paid at all. Paid it all. It's a pity that you have to do a GoFundMe page in order to get justice. It is. It is Senator Pearson. Madam Chair, I, I, I do you need us anymore? I, I have a redistricting issue that I would get to if you're through with us or 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 not. Do we want to? Or? We I've got I usually give bills an hour or day delay over oh, okay. in case somebody says what do you mean you're voting it um so I've, I've got everything tomorrow i'd like to vote out as much as we can tomorrow the other one is the timeshare one i think we're going to vote out we'll hear from rebecca uh, samaroff from the tax department and i'm hoping that one's ready to go too um i'm okay. trying to Boy, 10 o'clock on Friday night. So are you leaving us or did you? Well, that's, up to, that's up to you, Madam Chair. Uh, <clears throat> if you're done with me, I would leave. But... Uh, I, I can be very done. I think <laughs> we are so done with you. So <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. I think we are done. Um, you want to end live stream? We can end live stream. <laughs> and right now,